uh, hello, the last man standing situation. <laughs> Uh, um, well, at least I can promise, you know, that we will have fun and uh, I'm hoping that you will actually, you know, catch the, the, the spirit of, of this uh, panel. I'm very happy and very proud of my panelists. So, uh, uh, at the beginning of the table, it's uh, Žarka uh, and she's a journalist and then uh, Ifigenia, uh, she is a PhD in social sciences and uh, dealing uh, with uh, migrant integrations. Uh, then uh, it's uh, Alexander, uh, he is a political analyst and researcher. And uh, next to me is my colleague that is Master of Political Sciences and volunteer and activist of the Welcome uh, Initiative. Uh, so the, as you have uh, seen you know, by, uh, in, the, in the program, we are dealing with uh, Kine politics and that is politics of movement. Uh, I would say, uh, um, I would go that far to say actually that the 21st century is the century of the migrants uh, regarding the increased number, social, <laughs> social expulsion and uh, migratory resistance. Uh, the, uh, the figure of the migrant is a political concept implying that the person is stigmatized as a result of its mobility. And we all know that the mobility is one of the priorities of the, uh, of the policies of the European Union, but obviously not being uh, applied to all its even potential um, citizens. Uh, so um, at the beginning, I will uh, start with the fears because, you know, fear uh, is the uh, realm of the manipulation. And I think that uh, through media, but also through political discourses, uh, uh, it's been manipulated with the, uh, with the notions about uh, migrants and such. Um, uh, one of the, well, so why do Europeans panic actually? So where the fears come from? So there is a fear of the terrorism. So every migrant is a potential terrorist. There is also a fear that it's connected with the cultural identity that might be or is uh, for, sur for sure uh, connected with the majority of the migrants that are Muslim, not Christian. Uh, and also uh, a third one, third fear might be the one that, that the migrants will snatch the poorly paid jobs of the Europeans already being there. So um, uh, we will start with that. So Iphigenia, where the fears come from? <laughs> I think that you should just talk. I think ah, it's yes, on. it was on. Okay. So, um, okay. It was tricky. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, I so. tricked her, yeah, <laughs> I admit. <laughs> so I will inverse the question by borrowing some ideas from, uh, from Slavo Zizek. Um, I bumped into a recent article on uh, what our fear of refugees says about Europe. So this is, is, he cites Lacan, who gives the example of the, of, of the jealous husband. And he says, the true question about this husband is not whether his jealousy is well grounded, grounded. Because even if so, if it is well grounded, jealousy is pathological. So the true question, he says, Lacan and Zizek also, is why does the husband need jealousy to maintain his self-identity? So similarly, Zizek says, um, um, talking of uh, Europeans and their prejudice, fears about refugees, migrants, and all the others, uh, he points that even if more or less our prejudice, prejudice about migrants and refugees are proven to be true, so they are hidden fundamentalists, uh, terrorists, they rape and steal, they, they steal our jobs. The refugees. <laughs> the refugees, of course. They, they make more children, so they disrupt demography <laughs> and, the, and the purity of the nation and so on. Um, this paranoia, this is a paranoid talk about the immigrant that it is still an ideological pathology. So he tells, what he says, this is, it is, um, um, this tells more about us Europeans than about immigrants. The true question, so he says, is whether immigrants are a real threat. The truth question is not if immigrants are a real threat to Europe, but what does this obsession with immigrants and refugees threat 
tell about the weakness of uh, uh, of the weaknesses of Europe and the, the, the identity of Europe. So I will not respond. <laughs> <It's just> <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, uh, one um, uh, ambassador of the one of the member uh, states uh, said that uh, due to the closure of the borders and the deal with the Turkey, uh, Serbia will become uh, sort of parking for these people. Um, uh, which, uh, so, you know, sadly did happen, you know, at the end, you know, having in mind how many people uh, are residing in uh, camps in Serbia nowadays, you know, being in a, in a certain state of uh, limbo, of suspended life, <coughs> not being able to come back, not being able to go further, go further and staying here, you know, with unsolved status. Um, Sara, uh, there is a more or less similar situation in uh, Croatia, although migrants are uh, overwhelming the, the Serbian-Croatian border. Mm -hmm. Well, actually the, actually the situation, yes. uh, the situation that is ongoing at the moment in Croatia is uh, a very uh, obvious violence of Croatian police towards migrants because we have uh, um, not so, not so n n numerous uh, like uh, um, um, crossings of uh, migrants, but it's more like in small groups or um, individuals. Um, and every time, practically, uh, the police uh, uh, catches them, uh, even if people uh, uh, request uh, the asylum, if they show the intention to to seek asylum, they, however, uh, in most cases, beat them and then uh, through green borders uh, uh, push them back uh, to Serbia. And, uh, or what or leave them at the Slovenian border. Exactly, and then the other case which is happening, it's like they are trying to just uh, uh, chase away uh, all the refugees uh, from Croatia because at the same time uh, we have the situation where um, because of the Dublin uh, uh, regulation uh, many people who uh, didn't even seek asylum in Croatia but just passed through the Balkan route uh, in, um, in fall of uh, 2015 are now uh, by Dublin returned uh, to Croatia and uh, need to stay there. Yeah, so now the migrants actually are coming in Croatia from west, not anymore from Serbia exactly. only. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, this would be a question for you, uh, Alexander. So the migrant versus refugee, so the uh, victim versus uh, opportunist and uh, uh, fleeing war or migrant, uh, uh, economic migrant? Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Actually, uh, I just uh, would like to comment on the beginning Please when go. you when you said that uh, 21st century will be the century of m uh, migrants or migration. Actually, I think that uh, uh, only that uh, maybe last last century, but not not all, uh, maybe was without uh, such a huge uh, migrations. But we, all, we have like uh, big wars. But I believe that uh, migration is actually in the nature. Uh, of, of the humans, so uh, this is not anything exceptional. Of course, uh, that's what we wrote at the beginning. Of yeah, the, yeah, in no, the program. I, 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 I just wanted to to say that, like, uh, no, this is not a century of migrations. We are living migrations, and in this point, I'm more interested when this became uh, a problem, when this became so-called crisis. Yeah, so that's it. So it's uh, actually the. Uh, the migrant issue is not the problem. Actually, Europe is the problem. Well, yeah, because uh, if you if you even look uh, like I don't know in a, uh, meteorology, you have an area with a high pressure and area with a low pressure, and they are just like trying to um, uh, trying to uh, equalize. Yeah, uh, that's something that's also in a in a in a, in a uh, human's nature and how we all inhabited all this planet. Uh, but uh, I believe that uh, we should maybe focus just to understand this, uh, this position now on the moment when this, uh, this was uh, started to percept as, a, as a unnatural. Uh, and that's the actually moment when um, we, uh, we build our borders of our nation, uh, nation states uh, on one side and on the other side, especially during the era of colonialism and today of neo-colonialism, uh, when we uh, destroyed 
the borders uh, outside mm -hmm. our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And even today, all this story is actually, uh, according to me, uh, one of the, the evidence that uh, colonial policy never ended, that we are still this uh, fortress Europe is actually the, the construction which, uh, which began with the colonialism and uh, we are just uh, continue with the same policy just in, a, in other manners. And this time, for the, for the very first time, this is the, that precedent mm -hmm. which we now call crisis, is actually that these people are coming to Europe and not that Europeans are colonizing the, the other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And okay, maybe this. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's okay. You can follow. Yeah, <laughs> can yeah no, just uh, uh, maybe this. Uh, this can be a topic uh, we we can speak uh, about it all together. Maybe it's going to be interesting uh, for the end. I would just like to to think uh, and to speak about what for you uh, is a difference between expert and economic migrant. What should be, what should be the difference that uh, someone has a right to go whenever and to work and to other group of people we we don't allow that we uh, we define them as economic migrants and with that definition with that naming we actually limiting their their possibilities courage courage yeah 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 you're Uh, I think the, the answer to your question is perfectly simple. I mean, expats are the uh, people who uh, were born and have the passport of the core country of the world, which is Western Europe plus US plus Canada plus Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, maybe South Korea, uh, Singapore, and uh, the migrants are the, the, the rest. I think that's, this is, uh, of course it's, it sounds cynical, but I think this is how it is used. Uh, because there is no like formal definition of an expat. Theoretically it's the same as economic migrant, but it's not a coincidence that Americans working in Singapore uh, or Polish higher, higher class professionals working in, uh, in Taiwan, I know one uh, case, one example, they are called expats. But it's, it's the question of the country where you were born, whether it's a core or peripheral country in the division of labor, uh, or from what, what social class are you. If you are a high-trained professional, then even being from a half-peripheral Poland, you can be an expat. And if you are a worker uh, from, 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 from uh, like uh, Italy, for example, uh, which theoretically is a part of the core of, of the economy, then you are a migrant. I, sorry, but I think it's just pure ideology, I mean, this, the, the, the differ differentiation between these this, this two notions. Yeah. There was a, two, two more. As you said, Alexander, the human nature is that we have to walk. I mean, we are in the movement during the history of civilization. So there is no any difference. Any person during the... Com any person under the Convention of the United Nations which life is in danger by any of those, even if it's a hunger, has a right to move. And the whole human being has a right to move. And all that what is invented as a difference is, is actually the relation of the states and protection of the, your own area, your own state, and it's not under the convention. Therefore, Lola knows that we are permanently talking about uh, people are refugees. Uh, they are coming from the, if the human being feels any fear, and if it's in danger by feeling not secure, our nature is also that we want to be secure, not to be killed, not to be hunger, not to be, we have a right to move, I mean, this is, uh, Nature. So I think that any of those uh, uh, passports, I mean, this is the deepest question. If you look at the Adriatic coast, I mean, if you look to all, then think a little bit about Mediterranean and how it comes. I mean, how it comes, for what is the Venice, what is the Spain, I mean, what his, the history of the human civilization is in the movement and in the changings. 
And that what we are invented, uh, who is who by the passport, then they are keeping you on the Swiss-French border if you are colored. If you are white, you will pass in the, when you go to the self-service, but not if you are colored. That implicate on that, let's say, being, which becomes a symbol or a human being, we actually are checking, and therefore is this Slavoj Žižek uh, taught, it's actually our pro uh, projection toward the fear of the another's. So I think that there is no any, to the Convention of the United Nations and to uh, the Convention about the crime, there is no any difference if somebody uh, is in danger in a sense that he can't keep his own life by any way. He has a right to move, you know, and the rest is all the repression and uh, uh, the, the question of attitudes of different states towards the uh, question of immigrants. The whole history of the world is a history of moving of immigrants migration and migration, so this is unhistorical question at the end, humanistic, but also uh, unhistorical if we say that there are the different uh, regulations for one or the another, uh, um, uh, uh, another element of, of um, uh, existence of the human being, is that to be killed or to be hanged doesn't matter and it's a, a right to work in the same time so I don't I think this is convention of United Nations mm -hmm. yeah. just, okay. just a few words actually I uh, I like your question I have a better one uh, who can be a tourist mm -hmm. if we go in the same direction uh, <clears throat> Everyone can be a tourist if you're rich enough, which mm, exactly. I agree with your analytical question. But the point, the interesting point, especially in the French discourse, is this notion of the uh, economic migrant, the category they invented, which means nothing. And it's very interesting that we put the economic, because we have all this ideology that the economic system is as it is because there is no alternative, it's a natural fact. And the economic migrant is the one who actually has no reason for migrating because the economy is as it is because it's a natural fact and not like the powers organized that some countries are dispossessed and then you have to live having nothing. Uh, but the, the real difference we have now, and I'm just putting this idea here, is that with the, with the internet, with the communication technologies, everyone sees the gap of wealth there is between what they have and what exists in the world. What you can see in the TV, what you can see on the, the uh, internet, what the migrants in Paris, the poor migrants, they take selfies of themselves in front of the luxury car, which is just parked in the street to send to their friends. For the social reason you understand that they have to prove that they succeed. But these millions of people are doing that. And we know that such cars exist and that I could be driving one instead of living in a place where there is dirt road, no electricity, no water. And this uh, uh, fact that the, uh, like the cat is out of the box, we know that we can live well because some people live really well on this planet. It's not so, something that people are going to forget or say, oh, too bad in another life, not for me. It's, uh, because there is really too much uh, at the reach of some people and everyone wants to be the ones benefiting from it. This we will never ever going back to the, 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 the gap of wealth with the ignorance that really existed in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the lady. Yeah. Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, um, maybe uh, okay, I will try not to overlap the previous uh, um, sayings. Uh, thanks for the question. I'm not sure I, well, I mean, uh, totally understood the way you wanted to put it, but I think I would say that um, actually a uh, migrant or refugee is also an expat. So the, 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 the difference is just the, the way we put it by the political norms and the legal norms that are, that are raised to, to, 
to to uh, to create it, to, to construct, to build uh, public policies towards certain categories of people, and so the need for categorization. Uh, for example, in France now, yeah, there is there is even I think some weeks ago there was a kind of exhibition, commercial exhibition for pensioners wanting to to have uh, Riyadh in uh, Morocco, and so they become yes pension pensioners uh, buying themselves a, a, a nice house in in Marrakech or, or elsewhere in uh, in Morocco. So those people also new a new kind of uh, new kind of expats, and, and they are even welcomed by the very governments from Morocco, who at the same mm. times makes the situation like people want to, to to flee Morocco. But I wanted to add that I think even besides the, the question of the convention and the right to move, um, maybe people. Well, I do think that people have the right to move even if they are not frightened by something. And actually expats, when they decide to, to move, sometimes they are not frightened by anything. They just want to, to make their life more funny or something like that. Uh, and so, okay, so maybe actually between two villages in Senegal or in Ivory Coast, you, have, you can have different people. Some of them would go to, uh, want to go to Europe, other not. Maybe they are, the, 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 one, the ones who go to Europe are not more frightened that the ones who don't go to Europe. I mean, I think all the scholarly works uh, have proved that for many times. So I think we have to, to get out of this categorization, uh, which is uh, just uh, to feed the, the fears and to feed the kind of repressive policies, actually. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I over here? You want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. Vehina, može sačekaš samo Ifigenija pa onda ti, može? Može? Aha, ok. Ne, ne, ne vidim, te kaži. Aha, ok, kaži, kaži. Just a short, maybe the, like a, the question seemed a bit strange to me, but it seems a bit like a romanticized, like the question if, like people are free to migrate and move, it seems like a, and uh, with the uh, economic migration, yeah, it seems like looking for better opportunities or so. But I think like uh, or what I saw until uh, now, like uh, with uh, some contacts with uh, refugees, and I would call them refugees more than uh, migrants now, because that people are escaping. They are not uh, looking for better opportunities. They are really escaping from the uh, war, like a... Uh, mostly from the conflict i mean uh, like every i don't know which day like there is some information from uh, there are families that someone is killed and they are like uh, lots of them are were in the I, had to be uh, in an army on one uh, or i don't know uh, worked for americans or like a uh, afghani or army or have been uh, mobilized by or uh, pu uh, uh, under lots of pressure from uh, Taliban's or whatever, like so in uh, Pakistan or so. So it's uh, really that uh, the situation is that people are escaping and it's not some, uh, um, I think more than ever really we, we live in the same, in one world and it, somehow we, are, we do make a part of this uh, system that from which they are, where, um, this, the same powers that uh, work here or worked here, like uh, that we know very well from the 90s, are if, like uh, happening, uh, operating uh, there. So it's not some different story that we can't understand, and we also are very much closer to to all these mechanisms that uh, then um, it appears to us. So. I think also we here are, are uh, somehow, uh, somehow in uh, like um, um, a positive, um, um, like a positive, like the um, positive backdrop. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> of the same uh, story. Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, if again, do you want to add? Yes, I want.
I want to add something. Uh, uh, I think it is an important question, and thank you. And I will. I'm. I'm. I'm sorry. I'm afraid I have to disagree with the last. Uh, okay. With with you, because I think that these are not just categories, and uh, and it is. It, it does matter how we label things. And I will put aside the neo-colonialist uh, intro introduction you said, but I think that there, there's a huge class distinction there, and I will not go further. But for instance, I come from the, uh, from academia. In fact, I'm a, I'm a researcher, and it is not a coincidence that, um, for instance, for expats and all these high-qualified migrants, in in brackets, because they are not supposed to be migrants, uh, that everybody wants to take them, you do U.S., Europe, and so on, they have been labeled under the headline, let's say, mobility. We never hear of migrants. And about migrants, economic migrants may, mainly, but also environmental migrants, so the poor that have to escape hard natural uh, hazards. Um, this is immigration. So there's a, 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 a clear distinction of um, the poor and the rich. Yes. 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 Uh, yes, uh, I agree. I think the, in French, uh, expat, I mean, is a designation about upper class people <coughs> who have the choice to do everywhere because of uh, high qualified. So it's something totally apart. But to go uh, back about the uh, movement of human beings since uh, the origin, I mean, there were always was a two movements of, uh, I don't know in English, but in French it's nomade et sedentaire. You understand? Mm -hmm. Translation? Okay. Okay, and that's a dynamic, but it's not always, I mean, uh, some sedentaire want to stay in the place they, they had. I mean, they settled and it's okay, I'm fine, and my children too, and the children of children. Blah, blah, blah. So I think the movement is not uh, the, the zinification, it's a free choice or not free choice. And for different reasons, it's a, more or less, it's a question of the threat, death threat or at short distance for war or at middle distance for economic reason. This is a movement you don't choice. And, and it makes move, maybe. Uh, and also in human history, when big people listen, decide to move, always it was because there was pressure, different kind of pressure, and then the people decide to move. I mean, exceptional uh, at the question of nomad peoples, but uh, there are very few people in general in human, in human history. Sometimes they have a real good important power in the, the, when they move and they decide to settle. For instance, Mongolia, stuff, a lot of stories of it. But I think you know, the main difference is uh, they, they, they have no choice. And maybe, I mean, uh, in, for the village, Senegal village, uh, two people, one will stay and all, but it was only in each mind the feeling of the threat. But the man who move is always under this pressure. He has no choice and he has to, to move. So for this, it's, it's uh, no sense to make so big difference like in France between economic migrant and uh, 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 political migrant. Also because, I mean, uh, uh, the, the crisis, it's, uh, uh, it has real consequences of, of human life. So at the end, uh, it's a war, a real war, war with weapons and war with uh, uh, economic weapons, which is not so different. So for me, the, the, the movement is the same and the analysis is the same. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Uh -huh. Okay, so we have uh, Sara wants to add something. Jarka, you also? Uh, yeah? Okay, so question was basically um, about the the distinction and uh, the relation of uh, experts and um, economic migrants, but what, uh, what bothers me more is this forced distinction that happened like uh, a year and a half ago between economic migrants and refugees, because we are, uh, not we, but <laughs> like media and public it, are it's generally... It's a bad guy, good guy exactly. uh, distinction. So we have like these economic migrants who could stay home, but they are like coming here and taking everything from us. And we have poor refugees that we need to help. And then um, even throughout um, the crisis, uh, it was like uh, one month the Afghanis are refugees, but the next month, no, we decided now that they are economic migrants. And uh, I think that the biggest problem is that uh, we are at the moment uh, narrowing the, the 
um, the meaning of a refugee and uh, that the political elites are really trying to narrow it and are at the same time ignoring that uh, everything that is happening in the in the world is actually uh, uh, producing new type of uh, refugees and these are refugees who are coming from completely destroyed uh, societies where, where they cannot get any education, where they cannot get jobs, where they are hungry, where um, um, climate issues are so big that they don't have any food to eat uh, in any way and water as well. And uh, I think that this is even bigger problem than this, uh, this distinction between expats and economic migrants, which is, uh, for me, more or less a, a class question. And uh, um, in Europe, I would say very much also um, a racial issue. But, uh, but I think that this one, this distinction between economic migrants and refugees, that is like actually there is a big tendency of using it in the last almost two years, I think it's provoking even more, more damage uh, for them. Yeah. Just, uh, just, just con concluded the, mm -hmm. the question, yeah. No, I just, uh, I just would like to, uh, to say the, 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 the reason uh, yeah, of this because, the bomb. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, because we were speaking about fears and I just wanted to stress about these fake constructions basically between uh, the, uh, the expats and uh, economical migrants. Uh, because that's actually one of the indicators of, uh, of our fears, but that I'm going to speak in the next <laughs> round. Zarka, <laughs> please. Zarka. Yeah, uh, I would just like to lean on what Pohida was saying when she was mentioning backgrounds and we are talking about people uh, which we basically don't know where they come from and what <coughs> is the situation in their country. So we have at the moment uh, the situation that we have uh, 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 agency news, uh, very low profiled, uh, about what has happened today somewhere, and we have uh, numbers of some people uh, drowned or killed, and nothing else. So uh, basically, we don't know when we're talking about the refugees or if you want to say economic migrants or whatever you want to use, in, and in both cases, we don't know the, the background of those people. And that is uh, basically the problem of media coverage of, of this issue. It's uh, the, the, the question of, it, it's basically the fact that journalism uh, fall into a propaganda led by politicians. And when we, we can, make, we can uh, for example, take uh, <coughs> the, the, the expression of refugee crisis, all media are using it from the beginning. Even though we don't have refugee crisis, it's not refugee crisis, it's a crisis of European institutions. It's a crisis of European policies if we want to talk about that. So, um, what is the difference between, for example, 2015 and 2017 is the fact that today we don't have basically media coverage of so-called refugee crisis, because that is a policy of European Union today. Those people are not existing. We have in Greece around 50,000 people 60,000 people, even worse, and we don't know issues, problems. We know only the, the, the situations when some camp is burned down, or uh, if we have some strike, and something like that. So, uh, for example, if you want to uh, sell as a freelancer story today about the refugees, you can't do that because media are not interested in that. And that is a really, really uh, big problem. Uh, yeah. Uh, regarding Serbia, but I think the, the, the problem with media is global. But since I live here, I would like to, to, to point that out. Uh, Serbia, uh, media in Serbia are functioning on a very low level when we talk about uh, media coverage of, of uh, issue of refugees in this country. So we have basically news 
and we have numbers of people who are coming or leaving or staying. And that is all that we have. We don't have a, a broader picture. We don't uh, have, I don't remember any story uh, in, in last year or more uh, about the situation in Syria, some analyses about the situation in Afghanistan. Do we know, have we ever heard about Kunduz before uh, a USA bombed uh, a, a hospital of, of, of doctor without, doctors without borders? And for example, if you want to, uh, the, the, um, what happened a week ago in Kabul, <coughs> we had big news that there was two explosions in diplomatic area of Kabul, and there were like 150 people killed, mostly civilians. But two days after, and that was a huge news, but two days after that, we had a uh, huge explosion on, on funeral in Kabul. And that was just the news. So it's, it's, uh, it's basically how we approach to, 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 uh, to, to a problem. If we, that's why we have fear. That's, that's why it's not a problem for some tabloids to make fear mongering. And that's why we have so much sen uh, sensationalism, sorry. So just to get back to Serbia. Uh, the problem with Serbian media is that uh, covering of, of refugee is, issue is basically very shallow. Uh, uh, we have at this point around, uh, officially around 6,000 people in country. Unofficially we have around 8,000 people in the country. And all we know about them is the number, and we are not sure about that because we have different numbers of UNHCR and NGOs who are in the field, and we have different number of official, of commissariat or state. Uh, we don't know who those people are. We know only that they are coming from Afghanistan mostly, Pakistan, and that's it. Syria is not even mentioning anymore. Yeah, and uh, by the far most common descript uh, description of immigrants is illegal. Yeah, so exactly. So it's, uh, you know, by uh, the, some of the researchers, so the word illegal always goes with the migrant. So it's also, you know, sending the message to the uh, public. Yes. And uh, there is always an uh, NGO called Atina made some survey uh, with the locals in Serbia but also with refugees. And uh, what they concluded when we talk about media is that uh, most of people think that uh, covering of uh, refugees in this country is negative. We don't have positive stories about those people. And basically, we don't have human face of refugee stories in Serbia. And that is the biggest problem. And we are going to change that. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> because we are working, you know, on uh, more than one project that is dealing actually with, uh, with the issues of migrant policies and so on. And we are uh, actually uh, talking uh, a lot and we are trying to establish some kind of uh, leadership among uh, the migrant community, especially targeting uh, young, young, uh, younger generations. So uh, in that line, uh, uh, Iphigenia, you know, I would turn now the, the floor to you regarding the disadvantages and due uh, the lack of uh, formal education. Uh, what are your experiences with that? Okay. Um. I will give a little bit of uh, context on uh, what uh, it is behind. And okay, probably it depends on the perspective, but we can say in some, somehow that maybe there are positive stories and news about refugees in Greece, and then probably not. It depends on, I will come back to this later. So um, I'm now working in uh, the Ministry of Education. It is a working group for uh, uh, the monitoring, coordination, and so on of the refugee children education. And um, how did we get there? 
I mean, in March 2016, you all know that the borders were closed and, in, and practically Schengen was suspended. So we had something like we still have, and we still don't know exactly the numbers, but officially about 62,000 people stranded in Greece who do not want to be in Greece. Um, the then um, Minister of Education, who was, parenthesis, kicked off by the church, so we have a new one now, um, had a vision, it was uh, about these children, that these children, refugee children, should get some, should become a little bit happy knowing that they're coming from the war. Um, so he had this, uh, he, 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 he has constituted a kind of, not a kind, a scientific committee. He took 30 or 50 academics from all over, the, from all over Greece, all the universities of Greece, of course, uh, which are relevant to, uh, sectors relevant to refugee education and refugees in general. And uh, they constitute a, a program of how to get uh, the refugee children into Greek schools and to integrate them into the educational system. And in August, uh, last August, in fact, 2016, they constituted afterwards a working group, which I'm part of, to implement this plan. So basically, we have, we, we count more or less 62,000 people stranded in Greece, about 18,000 their children of age to zero to 18, youth also. Uh, about 15,000 should be of school age uh, six to primary and secondary school. And, um, and the plan was to, to, in fact, to um, first tackle the problem of refugee camps, which are all over Greece, about 30 refugee camps, open most of them, which means that um, the, people, people, pe the people can come and go freely. Of course, in the islands you have these famous hotspots which people are pre imprisoned there. But, uh, and we do not have the right to touch these things. So our, our um, implementation plan, let's say, should not touch the, uh, the untouchables, which are the, chil the, the children and the people stranded in the islands. So we did do not uh, we were not able to do something for them. This is why I'm wondering if it is a success or a failure. Um, well, it, in, in some, in some, somehow it is a success in the sense that, okay, we managed to have at schools at least 5,000 children, which is one third of the existing school age children, let's say, but we did not, nothing about um, the non-compulsory education, meaning 15 plus, we were not able, which is also the most sensitive age about trafficking and all. So you have, uh, you, yeah, I will not get into this. We were not able. Um, well, some, do I have some more time? Yes. So, um, challenges and difficulties, oh, to say just a few words about the program, this is a, this is a, a specific program like assimilates a, li a, 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 a little bit what we have called in other countries like Germany and Sweden, the welcome classes. So there are special programs for refugee children only. Refugee in the wide sense of the Convention of Geneva. So we don't look here at the legal status. If this people are in the camps and they consider themselves as refugees and have, have, uh, have, uh, have applied for some, some kind of protection, they are considered like this and, they, and all children have access to, to the schools. And the innovation was that they, uh, they, were, uh, they, they had the right to get into the schools with no documents. The only pre um, the, the only criterion was the hygiene and this for the reasons that you might understand, but also because it is the big argument of the Golden Dawn, which is the fascists that say, oh, our children will get, will get sick because all these people who are not people coming from these strange, bizarre places that full of, full of <laughs> sicknesses and diseases and so on. So we, we were very careful about, about this. There was a vaccination program and also an epidemiological program, so not to get 
a, a massive, let's say, disease that everybody will catch it and so on. So the program was, uh, the bad thing is that these children in a way, and this is a huge critique also the, to the program, kind of ghetto, ghetto, is a, ghetto, ghetto, yes, um, because it's uh, the, the, um, the afternoon shift, so when most schools finish, this starts, it's two to six, um, but this, but there is some good aspects, at least personally, I think there are some good aspects because you protect somehow these children because um, not all schools were very friendly with, this, with these children. And also it's, it was a, speci a specific program to get them, how, however, into, to, 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 to give a boost to their schooling because you have children that have not been to school, they're 15 years old or they are 10 years old and they have been only two or three years to school because of the war. So you have different ages, different schooling ages, different, uh, different needs, different languages, everything is different. <laughs> okay. Well, the program was, um, they are taught English, Greek, ICT, so computer science, physical education and arts. And the idea behind was to get them ready somehow, to get them not ready, but used to some kind of normality, school normality, wherever they will be in the next four, five, six months, one year, either in Greece or elsewhere. So the idea was not just to do history, to learn the Greek history and so on, but learn some Greek if they will stay in Greece, but also English and ma in maths also, sorry. So uh, this is about the program, and, and the last thing I will, I, will, I will say it is there are huge challenges and difficulties, and the first one is the lack of funds. Um, let me remind you that <laughs> Greece is in a huge crisis the last seven years, not to say ten. So apart from what one can understand only for this, from this statement, there's also a formal one that it is you cannot move because of the Troika, you cannot, um, the, the, the nothing passes in the, from, uh, if, if it has some public cost. So if you need specialized teachers and you have to pay them more, but it will not pass. So we had to deal with this problem with, with very small um, budget. And um, on the other hand, we had to face, and I'm sorry, I know that I'm in an NGO environment, but we were con concurrents with the NGOs and international organizations who received huge amounts of money, um, mainly through DG ECHO, probably you know it is the, the Commission's humanitarian sector, and also AMIF, this new fund they, they made for, um, for, my, for, for refugees and migrants. Um, so to provide non-formal education. So our relation as a group, as a working group with the organizations, of course now it's, a, it's, it's much better than it was like say before Christmas or even before Easter I would say, before April, because we were concurrent in the sense that if children are to go to school, they will, they will not go to their for non-formal education activities, which are they are paid for. Um, I don't know if uh, this is this is clear. So there was kind of competition: who will get the children, the formal school or the organisations? Um, and this was quite a big problem because also with numbers we had problems. We had, for instance, peop uh, people moving from the camps, fr hopefully to go to the apartments. This is a new UNHCR project with uh, um, municipalities in the big cities of Greece. So taking these people from the camps, which was great for them, but we lost them, meaning we lost the children. We could, we could not trace the children because the organizations would not give them the names and the, 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 the addresses because of the personal criteria, person, the protection of, uh, uh, and so on. Of course, they gave. It. Of course, there's no. Of course, we 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 struggled. And they, we got um, some some data in order mainly to plan <coughs> the next year, which are, which will be a different plan um, because we have people in the camps now, but we have also in apartments. So this was a second challenge. 
The third challenge is what I'm, I'm, I've just said, but in, in, a, in a different way, so moving people. There's a huge fluidity, and it is not necessarily the numbers that are problematic. We're more or less at around 62,000, um, but these persons are not the same, and they are not in the same places. So you have people registering in one camp, and because the situation is better in another, or they have family in another camp, or in another camp in another, in another city or in another region, they will move, and then you don't know who is going to, who is, who is um, at, at each moment for, for how many pe children we're talking about. So, and also, you have to imagine that these are mainly big camps, so you have a huge quantity of, of children having to get into some schools that are already full, because remind, I remind, recall this, this story of the Troika, you cannot just open schools like this, because this, is, this, this um, increases the costs for public education. So this, this, was another, um, this was another problem. Um, okay, shall we continue so that uh, that we maybe yes. animate you know the, yes. the, the public maybe yeah, drop another question. Problems don't stop. So yes, we all can talk uh, know, for hours can, about can, our topics. Yes. That's for, quite sure. So uh, now we are going in the, a bit different direction. So while art itself might not change the world, it is clear <laughs> that it can empower those who will. So, Alex, I'm calling upon you to tell us uh, briefly about the project SOCAC, uh, project on uh, diversity and curiosity that uh, you've been uh, working on. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a project we are uh, working together. Uh, and uh, the, main, uh, the main aim and the focus uh, of the SOCAC project is uh, on, uh, on the young people from the refugee, uh, from the refugee community. Uh, where we uh, where we uh, work with them through the workshops, artistic uh, workshops, uh, in aim of their empowerment, but also of their uh, socialization. And uh, what we insist during this project is that uh, the participants should be both from the local and the refugee community, because we believe that integration is a two-way uh, two-way process and that uh, we necessarily should include the, the local uh, population, uh, which, um, uh, which also will be exposed to, to the influence uh, of, of the other community. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the beginning, so uh, we had two workshops until now. Mm -hmm. uh, first one was um, theatrical, it was uh, like a small, uh, sm small performance held here. Uh, the other one uh, was a workshop of photography, uh, and uh, we uh, we intending to develop it uh, develop it further. Uh, but but actually, actually, using art and culture as a means of uh, of the of the integration process. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. So this is the methodology that the project is planning to uh, go on with. Yes. Yes. And uh, we are uh, we also have a cooperation with. Uh, uh, with a different uh, artist uh, from the region, but also abroad, yeah. uh, like with the uh, also with Center for uh, Peace Studies, yes. and also with the symbiosis from Thessaloniki. Yeah, no? yeah. Okay, uh, uh, could you tell us uh, more about your experience? You know, mm -hmm. with the uh, uh, Welcome uh, Initiative. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, should I maybe just like uh, shortly yeah, give it, like a description just, of yeah, just, just, just briefly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, for. The past 14 years, that's how long we have some kind of uh, refugee system in uh, Croatia. Uh, Croatia was mainly a transit country. And uh, in the last year or two, uh, it became mainly by force, not by choice, a destination country for, for some people. We are still talking about very small numbers. Uh, at the moment in Croatia, we have like five to six hundred uh, uh, asylum seekers and up to now only so we're talking from 2003 until today uh, less than 300 asylums were approved or inter uh, so internet international protection it means either asylum or subsidiary protection and uh, in terms of integration uh, we still don't have efficient integration system in Croatia 
Um, and when we do, uh, for example, then the action uh, plan for integration is, um, is actually composed of um, things that are already written in the law and should be uh, already like normal and done, but are still not. Uh, so everything regarding integration in Croatia is basically volunteer work of NGOs and individuals. That's somehow how the uh, initiative Welcome also appeared. So Center for Peace Studies was, uh, I would say, the only actor on the scene uh, regarding refugee uh, issues when we talk about uh, not humanitarian aid, but really advocacy, activism, and so. And uh, when uh, the crisis um, uh, emerged and uh, continued from Serbia to Croatia, uh, Center for Peace Studies actually uh, um, came up with the initiative Welcome and gathered more than 60 NGOs from Croatia and also one uh, football club that I need to mention because I like it very much. Uh, it's actually a, a local football club uh, called Zagreb 041 that was established by um, former uh, um, uh, supporters of uh, football club Zagreb and who actually had the, the idea of a uh, um, club that uh, is uh, um, based on participation of uh, the members and uh, uh, that uh, ignores any kind of, um, um, uh, for example, um, racism, uh, homophobia, xenophobia, sexism or anything else. And uh, they are very important because they uh, include actually refugees into their um, trainings and games and everything. And uh, they also uh, gave a lot of support uh, at the field. Uh, so b besides the NGOs and, um, and the football club, uh, we also have more than 400 volunteers that are part of or were part of uh, the initiative until now. Uh, the initiative was actually uh, made as um, it's some kind of support uh, for the refugees uh, in Croatia, but it wasn't uh, um, primarily, um, I mean, it was primarily uh, uh, tackling uh, the direct work and help uh, uh, at the borders, in the camps, and etc. But uh, the, um, the main uh, uh, thing was also to, uh, um, to um, make advocacy for, for uh, refugees, uh, not only on Croatian level, but also on European level. Well, what about your personal level? Mm -hmm. My personal level was that for uh, uh, a year, uh, a bit more than a year, I was coordinating the initiative, which means that uh, practically during the, um, during the uh, existence of the Balkan route, I was uh, almost all the time in the camp. Uh, uh, I would say that like half month I was home and then half month I was in the camp. And um, it, is, um, it is actually uh, terrifying when you see how, um, uh, how media and politics uh, can turn things around and how, um, how things that are happening on daily basis are not visible to, uh, uh, to broader public, uh, how... Uh, they will only get the information about some kind of violence. Um, uh, we will start talking about national security and so, but um, actually how the things are happening and uh, what kind of uh, um, future these people have, what they've been through and everything else, it's actually not visible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would also say that uh, maybe just to connect it with what uh, Jarka was saying about the media. Uh, for example, when the crisis started, uh, um, uh, if we're talking about uh, Croatia, uh, first of all, everybody was like, uh, you know, uh, think about solidarity, we need to help and everything. And really, normal people, like people from Slavonia, which is like uh, the, the poorest part of Croatia and that has its own very, very tragic uh, history uh, regarding the war uh, that happened in the Balkans in the 90s. These were people who really gave everything they had, you know, like opened their homes and everything. And then we can see like through time and with some terror attacks in Europe and so, uh, how the media really changed, uh, changed people, people's minds really. Because I know when talking to like regular people that are not into this topic, uh, from 
from their comments like, oh my God, that, that's a great work that you're doing. Uh, they were like, aren't you afraid? And, uh, and they all switched this to like, we are talking about terrorists. Mm. And we can also see it now in, on the political level in Croatia, uh, which I uh, personally think is really, really um, um, dangerous at the moment because uh, we have uh, at the moment uh, situations where families where, with little kids are getting uh, negatives on their asylum applications uh, by, the, um, uh, by the decision of the security intelligence agency uh, and which are not actually explained because they have the right to, mm -hmm. you know, like keep it uh, private. And uh, at the same time, we are talking about new strategy of national security and the new law on homeland security. And for me, it's frightening because I think that it will just be used more and more to, uh, to narrow the, the possibilities for refugees and to be able to turn down anyone who is not, you know, yeah. something that they consider I, I refugee. also think that um, um, quite similar thing actually is also in a process here in Serbia because at the beginning, you know, uh, everybody was really uh, positive and open and, uh, you know, warm and uh, Serbian hospitality was even underlined by our ex-premier, now uh, President Alexander Vucic. He was talking about, you know, how Serbia is really welcoming uh, refugees and so on. But actually, I think that, you know, this optimism was based on the notion that uh, Serbians knew that the migrants won't stay in Serbia. So they will go and they will become somebody else's problem. So I think that actually you now uh, we are still going to, to face the, the problem, you know, uh, when the public understand that, you know, some of the migrants actually can't go away and uh, there, there might be a certain number of uh, real asylanti that would like to stay here, you know, and we will see uh, what will uh, become then. Um, I wanted to ask you, Jarka, because uh, you were a lot on the terrain, you know, and you were talking with a lot of, uh, of, lot of uh, migrants, refugees, uh, asylum seekers, etc. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your experience and, uh, you know, uh, what did you find out? Yeah, uh, I, would, I would just like to add something about the, the integration stories from Croatia. I think the, the, the most beautiful story that I know is Taste of Home. Mm -hmm. And I would like to, to have that here. Mm. It's it's really amazing project. It's based on, on refugees who are cooking their um, traditional meals and they are doing catering yeah. for everybody. And it's really wonderful. So regarding uh, the, the, the fact that I was on, on, on the field, uh, especially 2015, and that uh, because of the story that we are doing together, uh, the exhibition that we are preparing, uh, I was in last few months talking with people in barracks, uh, which we don't have anymore, they are demolished, and uh, people in, in, in centers for asylum uh, in, in Adashevci, uh, yeah and in Krnjača in Belgrade. Adashevci is north of Serbia. Uh, uh, can you please tell me, uh, do you want me to talk about uh, their personal stories or you want me to talk about the situation? Whichever you, whichever you choose. Okay, uh, there is one thing that is really uh, bothering me and it's also uh, very connected to uh, media coverage is uh, the situation that, uh, for example, uh, we had for, for eight months people, 1,500 1, uh, people uh, in, in, in barracks, and we had uh, media coverage about that only when the situation became so bad that foreign media started to write about it. Uh, and after that, we had our, at that point Prime Minister talking about the situation. Uh, when they decided to demolish uh, barracks, they needed to uh, <laughs> thank you. They needed to dislocate these people. 
and uh, for last month, uh, all our uh, centers for asylum seekers are completely full, and there is no space in them. They tried to put as much people as they can in, in centers all around Serbia. Uh, but uh, at one point, uh, thanks to volunteers and good connections with the group, are you serious? Mm. Again, from Croatia. Mm. Uh, it's, grass, it's a great grassroots movement who is helping refugees from 2015. Uh, we managed to find out that in a in, in, uh, forest near uh, Croatian border, we have a few hundred people without anything. Those are people who escaped. They didn't want to go to the camps. And till today, we don't have news in our media about that. And I'm not sure that there is any news in Croatia about that. No. No. The only news that we have is that Croatian police is beating them on a daily level. Why? What is happening? But you know what, just to shortly interrupt you, what, uh, what's fascina fascinating for me is that when we are talking about this situation at the moment with police violence, uh, there, are ev there are evidences, like so many evidences and photos of, we even had the situation like it was a week or two ago of two uh, boys that escaped from the children home and tried to reach another destination uh, from Croatia on and they were uh, severely beaten by, by the police two times already because they tried to escape two times. And uh, you, you won't see it in the media. Uh, the only, um, I would say, it, it will be um, maybe on television N1 and uh, yeah. on Croatian television it will be only in Hrvatska Uživo because there is a journalist who is really much interested in this topic. but general public will not know about it. They will, but they will immediately know if someone who is asylum seeker um, steals something or um, gets in a fight exactly. with someone, it will be all over the media. Mm. It's feeding the fear yeah. uh, as we yeah. started the, the panel with. Mm. Yeah, I just, um, and for example, when I went to Adashevci, it was uh, one week after demolishing the, 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 the barracks. Adashevci was completely full. And I was talking with people who were there for a few months, and they were uh, telling me that there is no space, the conditions are awful. What I saw at that point uh, was great described by the guy who was translating to me and helping me with, the, with things that I was doing there. It's like, it's barracks. It's just a bit more cleaner, but it's barracks, there is no privacy, there, there is nothing. So, uh, and also uh, what they told me is that they, they, they are, uh, it's basically something like subversive thing for them. They are every night uh, hiding in, in forest to cook their meals, because in camp they are forbidden to cook and the food that they are getting is awful and they, they don't want to eat it. So again, this is not the story that we can read in our media. Mm -hmm. This is not something that we, and I as a journalist, if I want to go in some camp, for example, in Preševo or in Adashevci, I will not get permission to talk with people. Mm -hmm. They will not let me in to talk with people. They will uh, come, uh, uh, just show me, how it looks like, and they will choose maybe one or two uh, of people with whom I can talk to. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, um, I, I'm not prone to uh, romanticize uh, the, the, the migrant story. Uh, so, uh, you know, because, you know, uh, migrants are people that are defined by their mobility, you know, that doesn't make them good or bad, you know. So, um, I would like to, to state here that, you know, we should look at the people, uh, not, uh, not at the mobility itself. So, this panel would not be, uh, uh, it would be a really phony one and not a real one if uh, we didn't have actually somebody that is really important for me 
uh, that helped me a lot to understand uh, things uh, happening to the person uh, that are traveling for uh, months and months. So Nadim is here. He's my, uh, my friend, I hope. Uh, and he's also uh, really, uh, could you uh, come down, please? Uh, he's uh, one of the smart, um, educated, uh, talkative, communicative young people from Afghanistan. And I'm calling upon him to... to uh, you can sit. I took an extra picture. There you are. Is there anything that you would like to tell us? about your position, where are you right now? And let me kiss you. <laughs> it's uh, the holy month for us that we are fasting in this month. And uh, we are too thankful for the people of Serbia because uh, they help us a lot. And uh, it's not that worse like Bulgaria. And uh, we can cook in our camp. It's not illegal now. It's Kernicha. Yeah, in Kernicha. And uh, the people that they are donating clothes and other things and helping the other migrants, we are thankful to them also. And uh, thanks for Lola that they made some kind of workshops for refugees and helped them to get to know about the people of Serbia also. And if someone asks some questions, so I can answer them. Thank you so much, Nadim. Okay, so I don't think that we are going to uh, elaborate more because we will go to and chat tomorrow as well. I'm inviting, you know, the you people, you know, if you have any questions or want to comment on the topic before we close uh, the panel. No? Ah, okay. So, je t'en prie. One little comment uh, to, to, to Jarka, because you, you said earlier that uh, this whole uh, is not a crisis of refugee, it's the crisis of uh, European uh, policies about migration, which of course, of course it's true, but the deeper truth, it's the crisis of the European societies, the, the crisis of welcoming. We talk about 500 million people, the richest in the world, and we cannot welcome these people. In France, 65, 67 million people, fifth richest country in the world. We were in crisis because 30,000 Syrians maybe would arrive. But the real crisis with the titles in the newspaper, the politicians talking only about the really manufactured crisis. Of course, and it's ridiculous that we are facing this when there was the, the bombings for the war of Kosovo, hundreds of thousands of Kosovo went and came back and we could manage because we can manage. We are so rich, we are so uh, well organized, we have such capacities. And that's really the real, real, the, the tragedy, the crisis for, from talking as someone from one of these societies, one of these six societies, <laughs> You have seen our French presidential election. It's really mad that we have everything they want so little and we are unable to, to share. It's really more than shameful, it's madness. As you said at the beginning, talking about Lacan and the, the, the Zizek comment to Lacan, it's the, yeah, it's psychiatrical, definitely. Yeah, but I would just like to add, uh, it was, uh, when, when everything started, there was a, uh, the, the German media w were trying to, to uh, uh, um, remind people what happened after the uh, fall of Berlin Wall and how many refugees from Eastern Germany came to Western Germany and that wasn't issue. How many, how many people came from Eastern Europe, from Hungary, for example, and that wasn't issue. Of course, it's a crisis of European society, but that crisis is led by policies. That's why I said it's a European, yeah. Yes, just maybe a small, a small addition, I think, to, 
to make maybe understand the difference in the perception. And maybe this difference of perception is now, um, will vanish with the time between uh, maybe Balkan countries, Eastern European countries and Western European countries, where there is a tradition of immigration for southern countries because of the colonization. And uh, I think so we, we are uh, quite of, um, I mean, all perceptions, all representations, the, uh, the formatting of public policies is also uh, informed by all this past and the, the, the kind of, you know, uh, path dependency, I would say, of, the, of these public policies that have been taking place since the time of uh, our colonization. And I have the, the feeling, maybe I'm wrong, but that for uh, uh, societies from Eastern and Europe and Balkan countries, this is more uh, of a new uh, problem. So I think it's also interesting to see how it's possible to build um, a united or a common space of solidarity with uh, people coming from abroad, not to say migrants, uh, et etc., et et and needing help and, and, and welcoming, uh, at the level of civil societies of, of Europe. Because I, I remember, for example, of some, uh, there are some organizations, even from civil society organizations in Balkan countries, in Caucasus countries as well, um, that are concerned by the immigration of their own citizens towards Europe. And so they are kind of trapped and taken into between two, two different problematics is that, the, for example, they were like of um, attracted or I would say seduced by European uh, Brussels, European policies to sign some agreements about, uh, um, I would say, pays sur, yes, so safe countries, safe countries agreements in Georgia, maybe it was the same in Bosnia, or I, I'm, I'm not sure. And uh, at the same time, those organizations are also now facing the need to welcome uh, uh, people uh, c coming from Syria, Afghanistan, and, and, and the like, and I think it, it creates a kind of contradiction, but maybe it can be fruitful in the, the, the terms of uh, building a, a solidarity and not to, to obey, I mean, a kind of European orders about these uh, safe countries agreements and so on and so forth. And I, I, as far as I noticed for the past years, I think that many of those organizations in, uh, I would say, uh, Emigration countries, which become now uh, uh, transit or immigration countries, the minds of the people have changed in regarding these problems, and I think this this is important. Thank you. Yes, I wanted to add. So, so um, about the question of the context, I mean, the context is, is of course, I agree totally on the les moyens, les moyens, the means, the means that in Europe that's no comparison with any other place in the world. I mean, we have okay. But now the context is changing. For instance, for Germany, there are two uh, different periods. Period was there was about what is German identity on the West and East side. Just after the Second World War was a uh, huge uh, exchange of population, enormous. It was for about 10 years in reality. Then in one still on the German identity, East and West. And after that, a new question about people from Turkish, etc., etc. That one context. For France, it's totally different. No, totally. It's different about uh, the colonial, which German was a short period of colonialism, but after the first one, he ended. And because uh, uh, people who came from the south with the northern religions, and so, but it seems today in France that it was a new question, that's a very old question, but actually in France, it became an ideological and political question about a sentence that we call uh, le, le, grand, le Grand Remplacement. I don't know in English, I mean, uh, the, in the, in, what? Population. Oh, okay. with, a to with a totally fantasmatic, but it's, it's heavy, really, in the, in the actually political context. And if we, if, if we may compare them with Germany, uh, the attitude was totally different for not only human uh, core reason, of course, but human reason. So, I mean, we don't have to, to, and of course here the context is the same, but for me, for France, I mean, it's scandalous how very so few people who accept uh, with the means that we already have, place, and also experience to integrate people, and so on. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> okay, anybody else? Okay.
for me, as a young uh, woman and activist, it's very interesting uh, when the uh, crisis of Europe or m migrant crisis, how, how, however, uh, it's um, because we, uh, who live, people who live in Bosnia, Serbia and Croatia, for me it's interesting how we forgot uh, does feeling how to be a refugees or migrants because we are refugees in the 19th and why we uh, feel the fear about the people who come from Middle East. For, for me, it's not, I, I don't understand that because we have been in this situation and now we hate these people. I, I think that it's my feeling about that. And uh, I thinking about that because we, we are not refugees now, we are uh, economic uh, uh, migrants. migrants. And we have a fear about these people. Okay, oh, okay he come uh, to Germany and uh, steal our job. And I, I think that th this is the this. Uh, sorry, uh, that that's the fear. We, uh, that, and that we don't understand these people. And it's uh, the political. It's uh, easy to manipulate it with us. It's, it's okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, Okay, once more. Could, could I respond to that? Uh, I got an idea that uh, maybe you said that we were, we were like in the similar situation and now we are afraid of them. Well, maybe that's the reason that you are in the similar situation. Maybe that's the reason that you are afraid because I can see that in, in Poland where you can hardly see any refugees. Uh, uh, not to count, uh, because our government claims that we accepted million Ukrainians as refugees, which is, of course, total bullshit. Because like 500,000 came, but as, yes, economic migrants, and that's obvious for, for everybody. But to be a victim of something, of fate, of history, is probably the worst possible starting point to become a, to feel solidarity with someone else. Uh, it's like uh, if, if you're in Poland, if you're in Polish public debate, if you uh, raise the question, well, but we, the Poles, we also immigrated and we were accepted by like French people or English people and so on and so on, then the answer is exactly. We were always the victim of history and now we were betrayed by the West and so on and so on. And now finally again we have to deal with Western problems. So like the fact that you had a war which as far as I understand, is by many people here uh, perceived as something that was somehow caused by like Western powers, Germany, US, but nevertheless that you can feel a vi be a victim also part of, not only of your own nationalism but also of the Western influence, then actually it's quite, in quotation marks, reasonable to claim, uh, well, uh, and again, uh, now we have to, uh, now we the people of former Yugoslavia, Serbs, Croats, uh, we, we have to deal again with the uh, problems that were caused by Western people, and uh, now they try to, like, uh, push this burden onto us. I think it's the, the similar situation, it's a very similar situation to the one in, in, in Poland, that we were always the victim, so why should we... Well, of course, France had colonies, so France should deal with that, or England had colonies or something, or something like that. The, 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 on, the difference, which is probably important, is that uh, we feel uh, to be a victim in quite abstract terms, like in World War II or in communist times, and you can feel us victims in a much closer like time perspective. So, but I think this is not despite of the fact that you are a victim. I think partially it's because you are a victim. You do not want, of course I generalize here, but as a, as a, as a community, as a society. That's, it, it's, if you are a victim, it's very hard to feel solidarity. Uh, in the existential level, in the collective level, uh, Victims do not feel solidarity, I, 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 I think so. Uh, okay, well, we can uh, sorry continue for, this. Sorry for uh, simplification. Okay. We can continue just, this, uh, mm -hmm. this uh, over our dinner. Do you want to uh, yes, add something? Yes, I just something? wanted to um, comment on this comment because I'm from Croatia and I don't consider us 
as the victims because if we are part of NATO, if uh, we uh, participate, not we, but our politicians, if they participate in the uh, uh, trade of arms uh, and so, uh, we are complicit in everything that is happening in the Middle East. So I say that it would be really uh, irresponsible of us to claim that we are victims when actually we are part of this big problem that is causing uh, things. We are all yeah. complicit. But the major, but we are, yes, that's obvious, but the majority of my fellow citizens do not share that. Hey, we, that's ignorance. We can, we can continue this, you know, uh, while uh, having a, a dinner with our colleagues coming from, uh, uh, from uh, the conference from Domo Amaline. Uh, I will wrap up this with the, with the, with the notion from uh, one of the refugees that said, this is not the Europe I was dreaming of. Let's wrap up with this and uh, we'll continue tomorrow. Uh, thank you.